Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I can go home now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brad. Thanks very much, Shane and, and Randy, for having me here. There's a lot of familiar faces here tonight. I know more people in Arizona than I know in Christchurch, I think. But um, I love coming here. I love this state, and I love you people and your spirit. This is one state you don't have to... You don't have to ginger people up. They are already fighting. They already care, and they don't like the federal government at all. <laughs> now, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. You can understand my southern accent? <laughs> you can't. Okay. Look, Reagan said you should always start with a funny story, so I, I can't resist this one. I was in Los Angeles. I bought some food from a street vendor. He said to me, look, you've got an accent. Where are you from? I said, well, I'm from New Zealand. He said, well, where's that? <laughs> and I said, well, it's down by Australia. He said, oh, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. <laughs> That's common core geography for you people. <laughs> no. So look. Everybody always says to me, why do I care about the United States? I say there are two basic reasons. The first is gratitude. You know, my country was saved in World War II from invasion by the Japanese by the massive sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway. And that's a very strong memory in my country, folks. The second reason is related, but it's more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom should fail in the United States, if you lose your constitution, your liberty, your economic dynamism, and your military superiority, all of which are in grave danger, the bad guys of this planet, I'm talking Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea, and their Islamic allies, and they are allies, folks. They will carve up this planet amongst themselves. Now, you have a situation developing where your allies all around this planet, from Israel to Germany, Britain, Canada, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Taiwan Australia, they're all freaking out, folks, because they see that your president loves the bad guys a lot more than he loves them. It's causing big problems, folks. Your allies are looking at America and wondering if it's worth being America's friend any longer. They see what your president did to Poland and Czechoslovakia. One of his first acts of office was to cancel the missile shield that was supposed to protect those countries from the Russians. Then they saw him abandon Georgia to the Russians. Then they saw him abandon a genuine revolution in, in Iran, left the people to die, folks. Then when the Muslim Brotherhood and the Communist Party of Egypt took over Egypt, he cheered them on. And now they're looking at the Ukraine, folks. The Ukraine has a treaty signed in your Senate under Bill Clinton guaranteeing that country American protection in the event of Russian military aggression. A treaty, folks. And now they gave up their nuclear arsenal in exchange for an American promise. And now that they need it, folks, where is it? So far, Obama has sent them a few hundred million dollars of non-lethal aid. He gave India two billion dollars in Agenda 21 Green Cities um, funding recently. Yet for your ally, the Ukraine, he gives them a few hundred million dollars of aid and John Kerry. <laughs> Who is John Kerry, folks? He's basically Jane Fonda with less testosterone. <laughs> but
But to be fair to Mr. Obama, he did put some sanctions on some rich Russians to terrify Mr. Putin into submission. I saw a rally in downtown Moscow recently, pro-Putin. A woman held up a sign that summed it up beautifully. The sign said, your pornography is harder than your sanctions. That's <laughs> what they think, folks. So you have a situation where your enemies are getting stronger, your allies are backing away, and Obama is gutting your military. He's cutting your army back to, pre to World War I levels, your navy back to pre-World War II levels. He's cancelling weapon systems right, left and centre. The people in Tucson can tell you about that. He's um, purging generals he doesn't like. He's driving thousands of good officers out of the military with the gay policy, woman in combat and rock bottom morale. He wants to cut your nuclear arsenal to 265 nukes and then down to zero, folks. The Russians alone have more than 14,000. But they would never use them against you, would they? Because Hillary's made them your friend now. So this is about your survival, folks. This is actually threatening your survival. And not just your survival, every Western country's survival. Because if you go down, we all follow. You know, do you think Obama has abandoned Reagan's doctrine of peace through strength? And what happens to your peace, folks, when you lose your strength? Do you think Putin would be doing what he's doing in the, in the Ukraine? Do you think Iran would be threatening Israel? Do you think ISIS would be committing atrocities across the Middle East? Do you think China would be threatening Japan and the Philippines if you had a Reagan in the White House? But people are dying, folks. Thousands of people are dying. The world is on the brink of war because this country has twice elected an anti-American president. And some people still tell you he's stupid. He's in over his head. If he was stupid, folks, would he not make a mistake in your favour occasionally? <laughs> people, Obama was mentored by pro-Soviet Marxists his entire life. Frank Marshall Davis in Hawaii, Alice Palmer in Chicago, both Soviet agents pretty much. Their agenda was always to destroy the United States military because they knew if they could take down your military, their friends in Russia and China would rule this planet. What do you think Frank Marshall Davis and Alice Palmer would think of the job your president has done on your military, folks? Be pretty darn pleased, I would think. I think the most significant thing your president said in his entire first term of office when he was caught off mic in South Korea with then Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. Yes, Mr. Medvedev, when I get re-elected, I'll have more flexibility to deal with you. Yes, said Medvedev, I understand. I will pass your message on to Vladimir. We are with you. How much more of a warning do you need, guys? Now, my book, as Brad alluded to, um, the second one basically deals with the Marxists in your Congress. And it's even bigger than my first book. And that was big enough and heavy enough. It's a big book, folks, because the deeper I dug, the more I found. And I couldn't leave out Raul Grahova, could I? And I had to, Raul Grahova, and I had to include your dear Kirsten Cinema, could I, did I not? Red as they come, folks, talks about supporting the troops, talks about being a patriot, hardcore connected to the Communist Party, hardcore connections to the anarchists and the anti-Israeli movement in this country, and she pretends to be a patriot. Don't be fooled, folks. Now... The book is really about the two big secrets of modern communism. The first secret, I think they borrowed from the devil, 
Because we all know that the cleverest thing the devil ever did was to convince people he doesn't exist. What have the communists been telling you in the last 20 years, folks? Pretty much the same, eh? The second big secret of modern communism, hardly ever discussed in the thousands of books on the subject, it is the ability of a tiny Marxist-Leninist party. It is their ability to influence and even control the legislative process in their country. What I'm saying is less than 20,000 card-carrying communists in your country are writing the laws that control the lives of more than 300 million Americans. A little bit far-fetched, is it not? Well, this is how they do it, people. It's through control of the labor unions. Now, up until 1995, your unions were run by hardcore anti-communists like Lane Kirkland and George Meany. But in 1995, folks, everything changed. That was the year that the Marxists of Democratic Socialists of America, Gramsciist communists, that was the year they took over the AFL-CIO. They got rid of Lane Kirkland and they put their member, John Sweeney, in as president and now their protege, Richard Trumka, runs it for them. They took over every single major labor union and then they conquered the Democratic Party because the Democrats are nothing without the unions, folks. They purged all the Southern Democrats, the conservatives, the moderates, the centrists, Joe Lieberman, the senator from Connecticut, was the last one to go. And then when Bob Mendez, Bob Menendez from New Jersey started standing up to them, corruption charges. He's on the way out, folks, because he didn't tow the party line. So now they own that party. So the process is very simple. The communists set a policy. It might be socialization of student loans, green jobs, cap and trade, card check, normalization of relations with Cuba, which they just got, a new start treaty with Russia, or Obamacare. Every one of those is a Marxist policy. Started in the Communist Party USA or Democratic Socialists of America. So the unions pick a policy, the communists pick a policy, they make it union policy, and the unions make it Democrat policy. There's not a policy in today's Democratic Party that cannot be traced back to the Marxist movement of this country. They're writing your laws, folks. Now, I want to prove this by using an example that should resonate in your state. Comprehensive immigration reform, otherwise known as amnesty. Now, you have Republicans, people. Now, put that in inverted commas like your darling Jeff Flake and John McCain, who tell you that amnesty will be good for the GOP. Because if you give 11 or 12 or 20 million illegals citizenship and voting rights, they're all gonna be so grateful, they'll all become staunch Republicans, right? Yeah, I laugh too. Look, we know that the Latinos who are the bulk of the illegals are often very socially conservative, but they vote overwhelmingly Democrat. Maybe they will change in 20 years, maybe. But we have 22 months to save this country, folks. They ain't gonna change in that time. So why do these Republicans tell you this garbage? Could it be connected in any way to the fact that the US Chamber of Commerce has spent more than $1.7 billion promoting amnesty in the last 10 years. What do you think the chamber wants out of it, guys? Cheap labor. Now, they want profits, and I'm all for profit. I'm all for business. But if you're an ethical business person, when you take your profit, should you not also pay your costs? So the chamber wants the profits of cheap labor, folks, but who's going to pay the costs of the destruction of your border integrity, the destruction of your national security, 
and the lessening of the rule of law in your land. They take the profits. Who's going to pay the costs, folks? You are. Is that ethical business? And is it any coincidence that the Republicans who tell you this garbage tend to be the ones most closely associated with, with big agribusiness and the Chamber of Commerce? Or am I being a little bit over-conspiratorial? What do you think? Now, this actually started out, though, with the Marxist movement, the communists. This started out in California in the 1950s with a Communist Party member named Bert Corona. He was also a Democrat. He set up the Viva Kennedy Clubs, the first organized effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. But he also set up a whole network through the southern states, through the border states and southern California of support groups for illegals. The purpose of these groups was to encourage illegals across the border, get them work in factories and farms, get them citizenship and voting. The voting was the goal, people. Corona trained up hundreds of acolytes to carry on his work. Three of them are very active in Southern California and have transformed that state. The first one is Antonio Villagarosa, until recently the mayor of Los Angeles. A hardcore Marxist, he used to go down to Cuba to cut sugarcane for the Castro brothers. He turned Los Angeles into a sanctuary city. He forbade the LAPD from enforcing immigration laws and the illegals flooded in in the hundreds of thousands. Changed the entire demographics of the state. Second member of this group, Gil Cedillo, a Communist Party supporter, until recently the Democratic head of the California State Senate. Big time amnesty activist. He is the man who got the DREAM Act pushed through in California about three years ago, which gave all sorts of so-called rights to the children of what they call undocumented workers. Third member of this group, another Marxist, the most powerful woman in California, in my opinion, Maria Elena Durazzo, the head of the California AFL-CIO, the unions. She is behind the massive union-driven and union-paid-for Latino voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts that have added hundreds of thousands of new Latino voters to the California rolls in the last 15 years, almost all of them Democrats. The result of this deliberate Marxist program has been to turn California from a reddish purplish state to solidly blue. Now all of the electoral college votes of California go straight to the Democrats, no contest. Hugely important in any, any presidential election. Now the leader of the movement today is a man called Alisao Medina. You've seen him on TV wearing a purple shirt leading an amnesty rally. He was until recently the executive vice president of the SEIU union. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America. He supports the Communist Party and he served on Obama's Latino advisory committee with several other Marxists. He is the man who got the amnesty bill pushed through your Senate a couple of years ago and he worked very closely with Luis Gutierrez the Democratic rep from Illinois, to try, try and drive it through the House. Gutierrez is a former member of the pro-Cuban, Marxist-Leninist, Puerto Rican Socialist Party. When they failed to get it through the House, basically because of you people, um, Medina went straight to the President, who he knows very well, and urged executive amnesty. And Obama did it, folks. A hugely unpopular move. It cost him the Senate, but he still did it. Now, here's a question. Anybody in this room tonight a former or current union member? 
Not trying to persecute you, just, just curious. Okay, we'll cast your mind back, gentlemen. Which organization in America 25 years ago was leading the charge against illegal immigration? Against the unions. Because they saw that illegals were unfair competition for union members. They would drive wages down, cost jobs. So which organization in America today is leading the charge to legalize the illegals? The unions, same people. So why were illegals bad for union workers 25 years ago, but now they're all right? Well, there's more to it than that, sir. Look, a lot of union members are patriotic Americans who love their country. But they do not understand what's happened to their organizations. Before 1995, the unions were there to support their membership. After 1995, when they were taken over by Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party, their agenda shifted to promoting Marxist revolution. The unions are taking their members' money and selling their jobs down the river because the revolution comes first, folks. And it took Alisao Medina five years of hardcore lobbying inside the AFL-CIO to get them to flip their policy from anti-illegal immigrant to pro-illegal immigrant, which he achieved at their national convention in Louisiana in 2000. The Marxists did it, folks. But the real question is this. Why does he want it? Why is this his life's work? And why was Obama willing to give up the Senate to achieve it? Let me say it, sir. <laughs> okay. You're right. But it's a bit, a bit more to it than that. Basically, Medina let the cat out of the bag at a big progressive conference in Washington, D.C. three years ago. He got up in front of the comrades and said this, passing amnesty is the number one priority of the progressive movement. Number one. And did he talk about compassion, reuniting families, giving immigrants a break, the American dream? Not a single word, folks. All he said was this, in 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we stand with these people, get them citizenship and voting rights, they will stand with our movement. That will give us at least 8 million more Democratic Party votes. That will give us a governing majority not just for the next few election cycles, but for the foreseeable future. In other words, forever. Think about it, folks. Mitt Romney lost by two and a half million votes. Eight million more Democratic Party votes, people. The first thing that happens is that Texas will go blue. And if you take the Electoral College votes from Texas, your second most popular state, add them to the Electoral College votes of California, your most popular state, which they've already got through illegal immigration. Do the math, add the totals. It makes it practically impossible for the Republicans or any other conservatives or libertarians to ever elect another president, ever. One party state, folks. And if you think the Democrats are arrogant now, what do you think they'd be like with 8 million more votes in their pockets and the GOP permanently out of office? Would it just be the IRS they send after you? Would this country become like France or Germany? Or would it become like Venezuela pretty damn quickly and Cuba not long after? Because that is the plan, people. That is why Obama was willing to give up the Senate because he knows that amnesty is the road to the one-party state controlled by the Democrats, the unions, and the communists. And you still have Republicans, people, telling you this is good for the GOP. 
These are not stupid people telling you this. They can add up numbers. I bet you they can tell you <clears throat> exactly the totals of the checks they got from the Chamber of Commerce, yet they still want to give the Democrats 8 million free votes with no plan to counter it. What do you call people who sell out their own party and their own country for some campaign cash? You said it, guys, and I'll agree with you. Now, I don't want to depress you folks with any of that, by the way, or, or bring you down. You know, you came here for hope and change, not depression. <laughs> Look, if I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in my beautiful New Zealand right now, building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. But this is how I see it, folks. 2008, Obama could walk on water. He was practically the second coming. They had the House, they had the Senate, and the White House. All of their ducks were in a row. And all those 60s radicals who'd been infiltrating the Democratic Party and the unions and the media and the universities, they, had, they finally had it in the bag, folks. Finally, it was all lined up and they were going to have their revolution. They were going to take you down, people. Who was going to stand in their way? John Boehner? <laughs> they had it, but in 2009, in 2010, something miraculous happened. And I do not use that word lightly. What do you think I'm referring to, folks? <laughs> the tea parties, the 912s, Glenn Beck. Where had you been hiding, guys? I didn't see you coming, but you stood up, you stood on your constitution and you blogged and you marched and you emailed and you agitated and you rallied and you put enough spine into the GOP to take back the House in 2010. Everybody knows it was you folks except for one person, Karl Rove. People, you guys, the patriot movement, the patriot groups, the grassroots, you saved America. Yeah. You may not see it that way sometimes because you're in the battle, but you imagine had you not done what you did, the entire agenda of the left would have gone through in the first two years. Obamacare would have gone in straight away, straight to single payer. Card check, cap and trade, green jobs. He would have gutted your military even worse. He would have had 11 or 12 or 20 million illegals voting in 2012 and 2014. Where would you be then, guys? You'd be screwed, people. The Tea Party saved America. The grassroots, the patriots, the 912s, you guys saved America. And you don't get a lot of thanks, folks, quite a lot of the opposite. But I'm here to say thank you, because without you, I'd be wasting my time, and this country would be done, and so would mine, folks. You are the heroes of this country. You. I'm going to do something now that's normally considered very bad manners, but I'm a Kiwi and I can go home, right? <laughs> so you don't go to someone else's country and tell them how to do things, do you? It's just not kosher. But I get asked this question all the time. What do we do next? Do we work with the GOP? Do we form a third party? Do we just do local issues? Are we making a difference? Are we wasting our time? Should I just go and play more bridge and hunt more ducks? What should I do? Well, this is my view, folks, and my only value to you is as an outside observer, because sometimes you can see your neighbor's situation more clearly than they can see their own. You have a big problem, folks. You've got 100 years of progressivism to unravel. That might take you 10, 20, 30 years. I don't know. But one thing I do know, you've got a massive battle looming in 2016, and you have to win it. 
Because if you don't, the Democrats are going to dissolve the border. They're going to port as many illegals as they need, bring over people from the Middle East, and they're going to flood you out, people. That's their plan. Now, there's only one force that can stop the Democrats in the time we have left, and that is the GOP. But the big question is this. What will the character of that GOP be? Because if Karl Rove and John Boehner have their way, they're going to give you Jeb, Common Core is wonderful, illegal immigration is an act of love, Bush, and you're done, folks. Because people are going to stay home in disgust. You might get a third party. The Tea Party will walk, and either Hillary Clinton or Pocahontas Warren will be your next president. But if you have someone different, folks, someone with the ability to put up his fists for the Constitution and a proven record of sticking it to the establishment, maybe someone like a Ted Cruz, for instance. <laughs> things could be very different. But how do you get there? I want to go back in history now, back to 1976. I know most people here won't remember that. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about it anyway, because this illustrates where you are now, in my opinion. 1976, you'd been losing your liberties, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, for decades. And the people were pretty darn disgusted. But they had no options. But that year, a man came out of California who spoke of a shining city on the hill, and peace through strength, and liberty, and the Constitution. And thousands of people, just like you, loved Ronald Reagan's message. And they got fired up, and they thought, let's join the GOP, and we'll march behind Reagan, and we'll get him the nomination, and the, the, and the Republican Party will welcome us. What happened? What did the Republican old guard the Rockefeller Republicans, what did they think of Ronald Reagan, folks? They hated him. They slandered him. They sabotaged him. Ronald Reagan was far too extreme to be elected. Ronald Reagan was a divider. Ronald Reagan would destroy the Republican Party. Ronald Reagan was banned from Ohio that year by the Ohio State GOP. And they beat him. They just beat him. They gave the nomination to Gerald Ford, and Ford went up against Jimmy Carter, and Carter won. How did those Carter years work out, guys? <laughs> Barrel laughs, was it? Interest rates up to here, gas queues round the corner, gave away the Panama Canal, gutted your military, Iranian hostage crisis, your second worst ever president, people. People were saying at that time that America would never be great again. How bad were those last Carter years, folks? You think back. Pretty damn depressing, were they not? But the really important point is this. The grassroots, the people like you, did not give up. They took over the GOP precinct con committee positions. They took over the nominating bodies of the party. They got organized, they got disciplined, and they got ready for 1980. When Reagan ran again, this time they were not going to take no for an answer. This time they forced the GOP old guard to give them their candidate. And they got it. Reagan got the nomination, he went up against Carter, and he took him out 48 states to two. Not bad for an unelectable candidate, right? <laughs> Folks, the Iranian hostages were back on the first day. The interest rates went down. The taxes went down. The economy boomed. He rebuilt your military. He rebuilt the, rebuilt the pride in this country. And he took out the Soviets without firing a shot. Any better president? in the 20th century? Anyone even close? 
And why did you have a Reagan revolution, guys? Because people just like you stuck it to the Carl Roves and the John Boehners of the day, and you decided the candidate. Could there be a message for today? Because right now, people, this country is Jimmy Carter on steroids. And you need Ronald Reagan on meth to turn this around, guys. Not just to go where Reagan did, way beyond Reagan, you have to gut your federal government and restore your constitution. You know that, guys. But how are you going to do it? Reagan was the great uniter, the great communicator. He could unite the social conservatives, the defence conservatives, the fiscal conservatives. He could get the libertarians on board. He could bring those Reagan Democrats across. Right now, your base is very fractured. You've got a million libertarians who gave their vote to Gary Johnson last time. You've got social conservatives, Tea Party Republicans, moderate Republicans. You've got four million Republicans who didn't even vote last time. And they've got more than 30 million evangelical Christians who are not even registered. With all of the vote fraud against you, the media against you, the dirty tricks, the unions, can you afford to lose any element of that base if you're going to win and you're going to make that victory worth something? Okay, so how are you going to do it, people? Because you may not know this, but some of these elements of your base don't like each other very much. Have you heard about that? <laughs> Two years out from the most important election in American history, the most important election in world history. Can we afford this, folks? Well, this is what I think Ted Cruz should be doing right now, folks. Doesn't have to be Ted, but I think he's the best one place to do this. You already heard he's, he's followed my advice. He's running early. That's first step. Good. He's talking about rebuilding the Reagan coalition. That's the second step. That's good. This is what he should do for the third step, folks. I think he should go to all of these groups and say something like this. We've got one chance left. We have to unite, and here is the incentive to do so. Because I know you will not reunite unless you, it is in your interests. So the first thing I'm going to do is name Alan West on my VP ticket right now. And then for you libertarians, I want your vote this time, and I'm going to put Rand Paul in the, my cabinet as Secretary of the Treasury, and he can do what he damn well wants to the Federal Reserve and the IRS. Clark Blanche. And then it's going to be Sarah Palin, Secretary of Energy. And it's going to be drill, baby, drill. Drill in your backyard if you want to. And then it's going to be Scott Walker, Secretary of Labor. And he's going to stick it to those unions, guys. Right to work in every state. Then Mike Lee, Secretary of the Interior. And you know all those federal lands they think they own. Mike Lee's going to take them and give them all back to their rightful owners, folks. And then it's going to be Michelle Bachman, Secretary of Commerce. And it's going to be EPA gone, OSHA gone. American businesses are going to work and produce and employ again and make real profits. And then it's going to be Dr. Ben Carson, Secretary of Health and Human Services. And he's going to end the welfare culture in this country and restore dignity to your communities. And then it's going to be John Bolton, Secretary of State. And he's going to flip the bird to Mr. Putin and Iran. And he's going to rebuild the Western Alliance. And then very important, 
Ambassador to the United Nations, no one. And then it's going to be Trey Gowdy, Attorney General. And you know what he's going to do to those vote fraudsters, people? And then for all those millions of Christians who don't care about politics, but they love homeschooling, they hate Common Core, I would say to them, vote for me and your millions. We'll make David Barton Secretary of Education. Your rights will be protected. Ted Cruz, name your whole cabinet. Run as a team across this nation, folks. Would you be inspired by a team like that? Tell me what you really think. <laughs> Would it unify the base? Because every element's getting something, right? There's something for the libertarians, something for the social conservatives, something for the moderates. And doesn't everybody deserve a slice of the pie, folks? We're all Americans. Well, you're all Americans, right? <laughs> so, because right now you have a big, you know, you have never had a bigger base, folks. You think of what the Tea Party, Mark Levin, the Patriot Movement has done to educate people in the Constitution, folks. I've been to 43 states of the 57 in this union, people. <laughs> the reddest of the red and the bluest of the blue. There are now millions of people out there waiting for leadership loving this country and loving the Constitution. You put those people together with a team of leaders like that, who would stand in your way, folks? Because right now, every four years, the Republicans put up a candidate, and every four years, the liberal media rip them to pieces. What would the media do if Ted Cruz was running with a team of 20 Rottweilers are all backing each other up and not taking any crap from anyone. How would they handle that? I met Ted Cruz at CPAC. I walked up to Mr. Cruz and said, Mr. Cruz, Trevor Loudon from New Zealand. He leaned over to me and said, that idea of running as a team, as a slate, that's phenomenal. I said, well, look, do you mind if we keep promoting it around the country? He said, you go for it. It's fantastic. He's talking about breaking all the rules, folks. Let's see how far he's going to go. So I want to say to you people, I want, this is what I'm asking from you, 22 months of the hardest political work you have ever done. I know what this cost you. You've done five years of hard, thankless work. It cost you money. It cost you time. It cost you time away from your families. I know what it cost you, and I'm asking for more of it, people, because 22 months is going to decide the fate of not just this country, but my country. Not just your children, but my children. I can't promise you much. I can promise you two things. If you do nothing, your children will live in slavery in this land. But if you give it everything you've got, every ounce of energy and willpower within you for the next 22 months, the very least I can promise you is the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could. What is that worth to you? And if you win, and you can win, you will give your children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth fighting for? So I want to say to you folks, Thank you so much for what you do for America, for Arizona, for New Zealand, for liberty. God bless, God bless America and God bless the patriots. Thank you.